All right, so let me wrap up um, lecture nine, just kind of giving you a quick orientation of where we're going from here. Specifically, starting with the next lecture, starting with lecture number 10, we will, for the first time, um, be introducing cryptocurrencies, native currencies, into our blockchains. It's worth actually, you know, pointing out, right, we've now completed nine fairly lengthy lectures on the foundations of blockchains, uh, and the entire time we have not mentioned cryptocurrencies. And so while it's true that the story of blockchain technology and the story of cryptocurrencies, at least up to this point, has been very sort of tightly intertwined, and while it's true that a native currency is a very natural feature to add to a blockchain, it has a lot of uh, sort of convenient uses, uh, in my opinion, cryptocurrencies are not fundamental to blockchain technologies. Again, they may continue to be very closely intertwined for many years to come, but I really think it's worth understanding which parts of blockchains are independent of whether or not the blockchain has a native currency, and then separately, you know, what if the blockchain does have a native currency, what additional technical challenges um, does that pose? And that's exactly what we're segue in between right now. So lectures one through nine, that's been technical challenges of building blockchain technologies, um, specifically around consensus protocols. It's really independent of whether the, the blockchain has a cryptocurrency or not. And with lectures 10 and then 11, 12, 13, um, we're going to be thinking about sort of extra things you have to worry about um, if you have a native currency. So there's a lot of reasons why you might want a cryptocurrency as part of your blockchain. I mean, what, the first reason is just it might be interesting in its own right. Like maybe actually your goal is to, is to invent a new currency. And the point of the blockchain is just to sort of mint that currency and keep track of the ownership of that currency. And it would seem that not, that was Nakamoto's primary motivation for inventing Bitcoin uh, back in 2008. But even if you're not, you know, like trying to challenge the U.S. dollar or really kind of have a sort of currency in the usual sense, um, even if that's not your goal, there's a number of reasons why you might want to introduce a current, a native currency into a blockchain. Uh, so, for example, right, we've been talking about these proof of work blockchains. And so nodes running the protocol, right, have to be sort of solving these kind of hard puzzles uh, and sort of investing sort of time and energy into producing a given hash rate um, in order to produce blocks. Uh, and a natural question, especially in the permissionless setting, right, if we're just thinking about people, random people kind of downloading software off the internet and sort of running a node, you kind of got to wonder, like, you know, why would people bother to do this? Like, why would I sort of download software that's going to chew up at sort of a ton of my computer's computational power um, to run, to, you know, to run this random blockchain protocol? Uh, and so one thing you can do is you can use a native currency to incentivize nodes to run the protocol by giving them rewards, okay? rewards for actively participating in the protocol with those rewards denominated in the blockchain's native currency. So for longest chain consensus protocols, a very, a very sort of simple way to do that is that whatever anyone solves um, a hard puzzle and sort of creates a new block that winds up on the longest chain, um, that there's this sort of a block reward. So there's some fixed amount of native currency that gets transferred to whoever successfully uh, solved the puzzle, whoever successfully um, produced a block. So, for example, um, at this time of recording, if you're um, producing blocks for the Bitcoin protocol, you will be rewarded um in the form of six and a quarter bitcoins so six and a quarter coins in um, the bitcoin protocol's native currency um, as of this recording um, that has a dollar value in the low six figures so um, definitely a non-trivial monetary reward for producing uh, blocks for the bitcoin protocol now if you're doling out sort of meaningful monetary rewards for you know producing blocks it seems intuitively clear there's going to be people who sort of, you know, uh, buy machines to, to try to produce blocks because uh, they might be able to make a profit off of it. So that's good, right? So you're incentivizing people to actually sort of run the protocol. Um, but as soon as you kind of introduce rewards into the picture, you have to kind of step back and worry, wait a minute, are we at all incentivizing them kind of too much or sort of in the wrong way? Right, because the worry is that, you know, nodes, even if they're not Byzantine, right, even if they have no interest in sort of bringing down your protocol, it's pretty reasonable to assume they'd be profit maximizing, right? And so we kind of want a sanity check that, you know, we've introduced incentives in a way that, you know, motivates nodes to run the protocol as we intended, to run the protocol as if they were honest nodes. So that's going to be exactly the topic of the next lecture, of lecture number 10. We're going to ask, you know, that question, you know, with the way block rewards are handled traditionally in Nakamoto consensus, like in the Bitcoin protocol, 
uh, is it true that um, you know acting like an honest node is a profit maximizing behavior um, for nodes running the protocol? And we'll see that at least in some cases, uh, the answer is actually no. So there are some additional incentive issues that sort of enter the picture um, when you introduce block rewards into longest chain consensus. And we'll study that in detail um, in lecture number 10. A second very convenient um, use of a native currency is to charge for the usage of a blockchain. Um, so thus far, we haven't really been talking at all about sort of capacity constraints. We've just been kind of assuming, you know, blocks in a blockchain can be arbitrarily large. You know, as you can imagine in practice, that's not true. You have to sort of have some cap on how large blocks can be. So there's some cap on sort of how many transactions are realistically going to be added to a blockchain per second, say. Um, and so especially if the demand for the blockchain exceeds that supply, right? So if really there isn't enough capacity to sort of handle everybody who would like to be included in the blockchain, then, you know, it's very natural to start pricing for transactions. All right, so that's, that's sort of supernatural, but notice that, you know, that is going to necessitate sort of a new piece of a blockchain protocol that we haven't talked about so far, right? So a piece of the protocol that decides kind of which transactions are the ones that get included and what are the prices that they are going to have to pay. So that's something known as a transaction fee mechanism, and that'll be the subject of lecture number 11. Having a native currency also unlocks alternative approaches to civil resistance beyond proof of work. And in particular, right, proof of stake, which will be the subject of lecture number 12. That's, a, that's sort of a different kind of incomparable uh, civil resistant um, mechanism that's used in a number of major blockchains uh, today. That's obviously only makes sense if you have a native currency in which um, nodes can stake. Finally, sort of as a consequence of rewarding nodes um, for running the protocol, um, they're going to wind up devoting economic resources to running the protocol. So they're going to buy machines to increase their hash rate, like in a proof of work context. They're going to lock up stake um, incurring capital costs in a proof of stake context. Um, but in any case, the nodes running the protocol basically, um, you know, have have incurred economic costs um, in order to help run the protocol, which they're then getting rewarded for. So they'll make profit at the end, but they're sort of investing in the running of the protocol. Um, and what we're going to see in lecture number 13 is that basically that means that an attacker who, for example, wants to like, you know, wants to sort of buy machines to control 51% of the overall hash rate to sort of, you know, control the blockchain, um, the cost it would take to mount that kind of attack uh, will scale with the amount of economic investments um, being done by the non-Byzantine nodes. So having a native currency, you know, by enabling these incentives, um, it also basically, you know, forces an attacker to spend a lot of money to successfully attack uh, a blockchain. So that's what you have to look forward to uh, over the next four lectures. Uh, so next up is lecture number 10, where we're going to introduce block rewards um, and talk about sort of a, at least academically very famous attack on proof of work blockchains uh, known as selfish mining. So I'll see you there.